Welcome to the Southwest Florida Real Estate Update, hosted by the York Group of Downing Fry Realty. Our show will bring you the most up-to-date information on the local real estate market, presented by leading experts in the field. Welcome to the Southwest Florida Real Estate Update. I'm Morgan York with the York Group of Downing Fry, and today we're joined with our host, Jim York, and his guest, Donald Ross Jr., President and CEO of Ross Title and Escrow. Thank you, Morgan, for the introduction. Well, here with Don Ross. William. Hey, Jim. How are you? Hey, Don, uh, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Uh, my name's Don Ross. I'm an attorney here in Naples, real estate attorney, tax attorney. I'm the attorney for Downing Fry Realty. I've been for 30 years, one of the owners. Uh, own Ross Title and Escrow. We've, we've done 20, 30,000 closings approximately. Um, approximately eight, nine people. We're expanding, uh, do quite a few closings, you know, try to do a good job. Yeah, you do an excellent job. I know everybody returns their call and everybody's prompt with the uh, send an email, so. We certainly <coughs> try, unless they call at midnight, they get a return phone call. <laughs> right. <laughs> Some people do. You know. Plus they can call you on your cell phone yes, too if they have a question. Yes, it's on my card. So, yeah. uh, hey Don, we're gonna continue our series that we had from last week about sure. the Farbar contract and how we can help you know, the consumer and we can help other agents learn more about it because it is a statewide contract. So what do you, uh, what do you have for us today? Well, I, I had, you know, our last show, we hit the basics. We, we hit how time is different, how they treat deposits different, how, uh, you know, the wash and dryer isn't part of the far bar contract, how mold and radon is not a general repair item, you know, certain basic concepts. And what we're really left with to help any realtor make a offer on a far bar contract is some basic understanding of the finance clause, uh, the inspection process, and FERPTA, because FERPTA is a little different with NABOR. If you know those basics, uh, you have enough where you're conversationally fluent in the far bar contract. You can sit down with a buyer or a seller and, and, and fill it out, and if there's something that you run across that's a little different, that's when you say, well, let me call you know, my, my attorney and we'll get some answers for you. <clears throat> so when they're gonna do a financing, how, how soon do they have to apply for application? For oh, they, they, they have to apply within five days of the effective date, which is the date the contract's signed right. and delivered with Farbar. <laughs> Uh, and uh, they have a shorter time period, and they have different terms. Mm -hmm. uh, they right. have a thing called loan approval uh, with Farbar, and, and the tricky thing with Farbar is if you, if you don't do anything within the default 30-day period, uh, there's deemed loan approval, which carries legal consequences. And for me, that's the one part of Farbar I don't like. But if you know that there's quicksand at a certain spot, you can prepare and work around it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always tell my realtors uh, and my clients, you know, put, put on your calendar day 21 and you're approximately eight days before deemed loan approval so you, we can talk and discuss your rights. But they have, if they do nothing, you know, w within that first 30 days, you have deemed loan approval, which means it's essentially a cash deal uh, unless you uh, have a problem with the appraisal or some, something property related relating to the loan approval process. Uh, that there is an exception to that, which uh, I've written about in the past. If your contract is subject to say an 80% loan and then the buyer applies for a loan and they get a heck of a deal on something that's a 90% loan, interest only, and they go with that, which is common sense, it's mm -hmm. a better deal. Uh, they don't get the safeguards if the appraisal comes in low. You know, you know the courts, there's been a, there was a court in Miami, the LaFont case, that just says that this whole deemed loan approval thing is what we call a legal fiction, it's make-believe, and because it's make-believe, unless you're applying for the loan in this contract, you don't get the uh, way yeah. out of it and get your deposit back uh, you, you know, if the appraisal comes in low, which in LaFont it came in like $135,000 low. Uh, and they did go <clears throat> interest only instead of conventional, which is common so, sense. So that's a good point if they change the terms of the contract. Right. Okay. How about if uh, a person applies for the loan, 
on the regular contract sure. with those terms and appraisal comes in low. What, uh, in what the NABOR I, contract, you mean? No, in the FARBAR contract. In the far, well, or if, both of them. Well, if, it, if, it's, if they apply for the loan that's in the contract in, in FARBAR and, and you have deemed loan approval because the seller, ha the buyer has not terminated the contract beforehand or hasn't waived uh, the loan approval uh, contingency, uh, the buyer would get his deposit back. He, he, he would be able to show, hopefully, that he made a diligent effort to get the loan, which they define mm -hmm. diligent effort in this uh, particular paragraph. It's right. paragraph eight. Uh, you got to you got to give the bank all the paperwork they want. You got to pay all the fees they ask you to pay. You know, you got to honest right. to goodness try to to get the loan. Uh, mm -hmm. They flesh it out, which which I like. Uh, and if the buyer can show all that and the appraisal comes in low and he applied for the loan in the contract, then he gets his deposit back. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's pretty clear. Uh, and again, because of this deemed loan approval process happening automatically, as long as the realtor knows, the realtor can point it out to his buyer, and, and also the listing agent can point it out to their seller because under this same contract, if you, if you go up to the deemed loan, loan approval period and, and, and the buyer hasn't terminated the contract, the seller has three days to terminate the contract after the loan approval period. The seller might have a, a, an offer for more up, money. Right. Yeah. And so the seller will want to know, you know the consequences of paragraph eight, the financing clause in FARBAR. Now, I prefer, frankly, NABOR um, myself because it's just more user-friendly for realtors. Uh, if, there's, if they're going to waive the financing contingency, they actually have to sign a piece of paper saying, or send an email something saying, I waive it. So it's not something they tend to do by accident. Uh, you, you, know, you know, Jim York, if you had just started selling real estate yesterday, right. and you know, you're just new to the contracts, you, you wouldn't miss this provision, and you'd be able to, to tell the seller or tell the buyer the consequences and, and uh, they could act accordingly. The seller could terminate if you're after the 30 days. The buyer could give notice they didn't get it you know, before the 30 days and show they made a good faith effort. Uh, and you could warn them about this LaFont case, which they teach in all the classes on FARBAR. So, uh, Big, you know, if, if you just calendar the 30 days, if that's what it is, and warn your buyer not to apply for something different than what's in the contract unless you get an amendment. Uh, and also, if you're the listing agent, warn your seller that if they go, if the buyer goes over the 30 days, you might have three days to cancel, mm -hmm. you're safe. So that's okay. really the takeaway I want people to get from this. And as we talked about in our last show, you know, you have you know, an attorney, somebody like me, you know, that you can pick up the phone and, you know, will you explain this to my client? That's right. You know, yeah. He wants to hear from somebody who, you know, went to law school. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it. I mean, you need somebody, but mm -hmm. for you as a realtor, uh, I'm, even neighbor, I mean, mm -hmm. it's very legalistic. That's right. I mean, what would mean something pretty cut and dry to you, to a lawyer, it would mean something different in either, either contract. How about the interest rate when they put that in there? How's ah, that? well, good one. Uh, <laughs> you know, far bar, if you don't put any interest rate in, it goes to prevailing, mm -hmm. which uh, is a loaded question. It's what is prevailing? Oh, right. I mean, it depends upon your credit, and uh, I've, I've, those are the things I get too late. You're sitting mm -hmm. at the closing table, and you have an interest rate that's like super high, and I honestly don't know what to do. I mean, I'll, I'll sometimes ask the buyer. Do you have a credit problem? Mm -hmm. why, why is this rate so high? Right. And uh, you know, if they had asked me way back in the beginning, I could have done something about it. But when they're at the closing table, there's very little I can do. But with Farbar, if you don't plug in the interest rate, it's prevailing. Nabor doesn't say anything one way or the mm -hmm. other. So uh, my my push on that always is put in the rate that the client can afford. The whole point of the financing clause in both contracts is to protect the buyer's deposit. Mm -hmm. You know, they're making this deal subject to them getting a loan of this amount. They've already taken their pencil out and figured out how much they can afford. Right. They can afford a payment of, you know, this much. And, you know, so that's going to require an interest rate of whatever it is. Put that in there so you achieve the function of that paragraph in mm -hmm. both contracts. Don't yeah. leave it, you know, blanks. 
not only leave you open to issues like that, but blanks also make it more apt that they don't read the contract. Right. If you're filling something in, they're going to say, what's that? Yeah. So agree. they get a better understanding of what they're signing. Mm -hmm. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of uh, filling in those blanks. Uh, the other thing about Farbar, which came up yesterday, um, the seller in this case, I had a realtor call me, uh, actually it was the buyer was terminating the contract because they say they didn't get notice of loan approval. And, and the listing agent asked me, what do we do? I said, well, paragraph eight in the Farbar contract requires the buyer to make a diligent effort, and it defines it. You know, filling out all the appropriate paperwork, right. supplying all the appropriate paperwork, paying all the bank fees, paying, you know, whatever fees they, they, they reasonably expect. You can ask for those things to see if they made a good faith effort or a diligent effort as they define it in the contract. So I ended up telling them, ask for this stuff. See mm -hmm. if the guy actually tried to get the loan. Did he, you know, get something from the lender saying, yes, he applied, right. he did it within the five days, and he supplied everything we asked for. He paid all our application fees and credit check fees and whatever other fees the bank might have uh, incurred in that situation. And this is a, a, a real live, good faith, didn't get the loan situation. Mm -hmm. So that that's good. The other thing that's uh, pretty good with that particular far of our financing clause is that the lender is authorized to talk to Jim York and your client mm -hmm. about the status of the buyer's loan huh. if you're the listing agent. Right. Uh, Nabor doesn't have that, so it's really helpful for the lender to have some authorization to open his mouth and say, Jim, they've su supplied everything they needed to supply, they filled out the application, I got everything. They can't disclose confidential financial That's information, right. yeah. but they can tell you, no, he, the status, the loan's going well, and mm -hmm. we've gotten everything we've asked for, and any appropriate fees have been paid, and, and so you have a feel that this person is actually trying. Uh, Nabor is, is silent on that. So that, you, know, you can look at both clauses and say, well, I, there's things I really love in Farbar, things I really despise in Farbar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that automatic deemed loan approval really worries me. For you Look percentage-wise how many new agents we have in any given year, and it's as high as 20%. Right. That's a lot of hard-working people who are trying to learn 4,000 things at once to absorb, yeah. to absorb that and neighbor and try to make a living is, is difficult. So I, I, I prefer if they had a different mechanism. I like some of the substantive points, like the seller having the three days to cancel, uh, the, uh, the buyer being able to terminate if they don't get their commitment, and I like the definition of due diligence. It makes it very specific. That's right. Uh, but it would be, uh, for me anyways, and it's just my opinion. I mean, I'm sure many lawyers disagree, like everybody on the committee who wrote this, they probably disagree. Uh, but I, I rather an affirmative act. That way you're less apt to make a mistake and you know, get the realtor in trouble and have a, a buyer or seller and not understand what the heck they're signing. Well, Don, we're going to take a little short break, and we're right. going to come back with your sure. two other points that you want to Great. make, and okay. we'll be right back in one minute. Thank you. Thinking of buying or selling a home in Naples, Marco Island, Bonita, or Estero, Florida? Think of the most experienced York Real Estate Group, associated with the number one brokerage in Southwest Florida, Downing Fry Realty, which produces yearly real estate transactions of over a billion dollars. Jim, Michael, and Morgan make up the York Real Estate Group of Downing Fry Realty, with over $275 million in sales transactions, along with offering over 25 combined years experience in the local market. The Yorks can offer the experience and trust you need in a Realtor. Call them today at 239-273-6727 or visit their website at www.naplesyorkrealestate.com. Looking for a real estate closing agent in Southwest Florida? Ross Title and Escrow has over 25 years experience and has closed over 20,000 residential real estate transactions. Donald Ross Jr., president of Ross Title and Escrow and a practicing attorney in the state of Florida with a degree in taxation is here to service your needs. Call Mr. Ross or one of our four closing agents for a free consultation today.
Welcome back. Well, we're going to talk about inspections. <laughs> Your okay. favorite thing. Uh, huh? My favorite thing. So. Oh, sure it is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's right. try it. Let's try it. Well, okay. We're, again, we're, we're encouraging realtors to expand. This is one way of expanding. You uh -huh. could, you know, focus on getting more listings, but you can do both. Right. <laughs> you know, but, we got to do both. But my, again, my, my, one of my pet peeves over the last 40 years is people let a piece of paper stand in between them and making a deal. Right. You know, the, the, the piece of paper is just the way to get to a closing. You know, learn the piece of paper when mm -hmm. things are slow. Use that particular tool to get your customer to where you want to go. If you have a minimal understanding of it, you, you can fill it out and you know, any fine points, call me, call any, uh, whatever lawyer you right. work with and, and, and really you know, come off well. Right. But in the inspection process with Farbar versus Nabor again, since I'm looking at Nabor people going into say Lee County or Punta Gorda or Sarasota, places like that, they have, it's, it's an, and we've talked about this before a little bit, uh, uh, paragraph nine, where you have uh, general repair items, you have wood destroying organisms, and you have permits. They have three separate categories. And the default language that the seller must make repairs for in each of those categories is one and a half percent of the purchase price. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I always wondered, and I honestly don't know, but I, I suspect, I, I suspect most people don't understand that that one and a half percent, you add them together. Right. So if it's a hundred thousand dollar property, you know, it's fifteen hundred dollars plus fifteen hundred dollars plus fifteen hundred dollars. So your seller is theor theoretically obligated to spend a a at most forty five hundred dollars. And you got to talk to your seller, and this is a Explain seller's that. market. Right. You know, where people are begging to buy things. You know, how much do you want to be on the hook for? And he's going to go to you, the realtor, for advice. And in the seller's market, my basic advice would be. If you're going to go high on any of those categories, have it be on the wood destroying organisms. Why? Because with general repair items and permits, the, the seller has the right to go above the limit. Mm -hmm. They have the option to go higher. Okay. The only one where the seller can't say, I'll pay the extra and force the buyer to close is the wood destroying organisms. Now, I've been to a lot of classes on this and they've never really explained why, but my personal theory is termites are one of those things that if you get an inspection you have evidence of live termites and they're recommending that you tent say this your home right uh, if I were the buyer I'd be nervous about buying your home mm -hmm. is the tenting going to work right. I mean, how bad is the damage inside the walls I don't know right. you, you don't really know until you take you know the, the sheetrock off and see the studs mm -hmm. really if you have wood frame you, right. you don't know so the seller can, with general repair items, in, in this current market, you can would go really low on general repair items, would go really low on permits, and, and you know, some reasonable amount for termites, because the buyer could essentially bail if it exceeds the termite amount, the wood destroying organisms. Uh, an option to that, uh, and I like this with permits in particular, if you do a permit search beforehand, you can write right in the contract that the buyer has taken title subject to the open permit and you describe it or the non-permitted work in Jim's kitchen or mm -hmm. uh, you know, wh whatever it is. And right. I've done that quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you tell people uh, what's non-permitted and uh, again, I've said it many times, my father was a builder and I live in a house that he sold me. Right. Uh, what do you think the odds are that there's some work there that might not be a, entirely kosher? That's right. You know, uh, do any of those things uh, affect the financing? Not at all. I mean, open it, permits or no permits or, are not a title issue. Um, um, with, with permits, anything over than six years old is not enforceable against the buyer. He will have to deal with it, or she will have to deal with it when they turn around and sell it down the road. Uh, but I look at each situation differently. Uh, I want to know how old is it? Is it 20 years old? What is it for? Is it that sliding door or is it the kitchen? Mm -hmm. you know, is right. it something small or is it something structural with wiring and plumbing and all that? Anything with wiring, it's just a personal thing of mine. 
I want to, I, I encourage my buyers to have it checked out, make sure it's safe, even though it's not enforceable. Right. You know, the old line, just because you don't have to, doesn't mean you shouldn't. I know actual cases where children have been hurt with exposed wires on open permits, uh, Isla Capri, Boat mm -hmm. Dock. Is it, you don't want that on your conscience. You don't want one of your children, grandchildren, to you know, have some sort of accident with something that you knew was not CO'd, you know, there's no certificate of occupancy, or it, wasn't, it was unpermitted work. Mm -hmm. Get your own contract to make sure it was done right. Just so you know, your, your kids, your grandkids, and guests are right. safe. I mean, safety is more important than whether you should or have to do something legally. Uh, so, you know, with the far bar again, you know, the seller has to do certain repairs. And in fact, I had this come up uh, last week under the general repair category, which is sort of like the defective items in Nabor. Uh, the, the question was, uh, there was a, I think it was a hot water heater and they couldn't find the part for it. Mm -hmm. So the realtor wanted to know, does the seller have to buy a new one? And I said, yes, yes. Because when you look at general repair right, in yeah. paragraph 12 That's of the contract, working. it's 9 and 12 together that you have to look at. But in, when it gets in more detail in general repairs in paragraph 12, it says repair or replace the following things, as mm -hmm. long as it's within that one and a half percent or whatever dollar number or percentage you, the parties put in that provision in paragraph nine. So, you know, you, you, in a seller's market, you, 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 want, you want most of the numbers down low except the wood destroying organisms. Um, you might want it higher, give you some wiggle room. Uh, if, if you're a, a buyer, uh, Make sure you put the mold and radon in there, and there's multiple ways of doing it. Uh, I have forms that cover a variety of them. One, just any form of mold where it's higher inside than out. That includes the allergenic penicillin aspergillus, or you could limit it to toxic like Nabor does, or you could just lump it into the general repair category. Just make it something at, that's part of that one and a half percent. So there's a lot of ways to handle that. But for a buyer, you want to make sure your mold and radon is covered, uh, and uh, you know what's the strategy. You know how high you you want to go. Uh, what's imp you, 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 the, the buyer would want a low wood destroying organism number because they want to have the power in their hands on whether or not they're going to go forward That's purchasing right. a house if there's a termite issue. Uh, the, the the permit thing, they should talk to a lawyer especially if you know of what the open permit is beforehand. Uh, if you use FARBAR down here in Collier County, you're going to run into a lot of issues with this permit clause because it actually delays closing up to 10 days, and after that, either party can cancel. Yeah. So you don't want that down here. No. So you want to put right in the contract, you know, run the search beforehand. If you find an open permit, say the buyer shall take title subject mm -hmm. to this. And I mean, honest to goodness, I mean, I've done that quite a bit. If you tell them up front, you're open, it's not a big deal, they're still excited, they still want to buy it, they sign, not a problem. Well, that covers a lot there, so how about... Could you stayed away. Good, good job. <laughs> you sure we didn't miss anything there? Well, I'm sure we missed a lot, but uh, there was, you know, I've written articles on this, and so if you can link to one of those... Uh, That's what we're going to do. Because I, I break it down a little more uh -huh. detail. Um, you know, the, the neighbor one uh, is, uh, you know, um, you, the buyer requests, the seller can say no, you know, there's a 10-day waiting period before the seller has to respond. Usually we, the strategy involves making sure the buyer puts their second deposit down. Then you can get very strict that, you know, we're fixing the things that are defective, but we're only a tiny bit more, just enough so we have a hold on your deposit. So there's strategy on that as well. Um, we have a lot of, let's go to the next subject here. Uh, uh, we have a lot of foreign buyers and sellers mm. here, so let's uh, explain to our viewers a little bit about how that works. Well, there's a thing called the uh, Foreign Investor Real Property Tax Act. It passed mm -hmm. in 1981. This is when I was in tax school. It, mm -hmm. was, it was a very hot topic at the University of Miami. Uh, and, uh, and it's a mechanism for the U.S. government to collect something from the sellers, the non-resident sellers of real estate before they take their money and go back to their home country. Um, 
when I talk to people from other countries and try to explain this to them, I say, well, if, I, I flip it around. If I'm selling something in Canada, I use that as an example, mm -hmm. and somebody gave me a check, I'd come right back to Florida and I'd put it in the bank and I sure as blazes would not be calling the Department of Revenue in Canada asking if I owe you money. Right. right? I mean, that's not going to happen. So they, to avoid that situation, they passed this law in 81 that they just withheld 10%. Why? Well, it was enough to, to cover most transactions and force the seller to file a tax return and pay whatever tax that they would owe, you know, based on what they paid for the place, what improvements they made, and what they sold it for. Mm -hmm. They pay the same tax you would or mm -hmm. I would. That's, mm -hmm. that's basically how it works, or supposed to work anyways. Uh, so, you know, if, 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 if the buyer would sign an affidavit saying it's their, their intent to use the property, uh, at least 50% of the time it's being used, there's an exemption up to $300,000. And then that was a lot up to a few years ago uh, entirely. Right. Why? Is there a logical reason? Not really. The real reason why? The National Association of Realtors in 1981 it was a powerful lobbyist. And the median price for real estate in the United States back then was 300000 So they were trying to exclude most of the transactions in this country. They thought it would be disruptive. Uh, a few years ago, they bumped that 10 to 15% just because of inflation, mm -hmm. really. Now, where the two contracts vary is in Farbar, um, it talks about a thing called an application for withholding certificate. What the heck is that? Uh, foreign sellers can apply early with the IRS for a calculation of what the actual amount that should be withheld should be instead mm -hmm. of the 15%. Please tell us the real number that we might owe instead of this arbitrary 15% so that we can get the rest of our money right. and go back to Canada. They still have to file a return, mm -hmm. but it, it gets them some of their money back quicker in theory. Uh, in Farbar, the buyer does not have to hold the escrow monies if they haven't heard from the IRS yet on that application for withholding holding certificate. In Nabor, the buyer does. He's stuck holding it. He can charge for it, mm -hmm. you know, $500, something like that, but he, he has to hold it no matter what the legal liability might be. Uh, Farbar, it's up to the buyer. So if I'm a buyer, and I get the buyers, and it's a you know foreign seller, uh, and they ask me about it, and I know this is not what we were taught in grade school, but I always ask, well, how's the seller been? Have they been nice to you? Have they been reasonable with repair requests? Are they decent human beings, right. or have they been a living nightmare? You know, have they been rude and you know cursing and all that stuff? Uh, if you're going to do somebody a favor. It, you know, it should go both ways. So it's a, it's, it's a poker chip, it's a negotiating tool. Will I sign the affidavit that knocks it from 15 to 10? Will I agree to hold the 15% or 10% in escrow until we hear from the IRS or not? That's a big advantage to the seller. So just make sure that everybody's playing nice before you agree to do, do that. And also, during COVID, honestly, last year, um, they've been working remotely, the IRS. My mm -hmm. sister-in-law works at the IRS. Right. She worked in Hyannis last summer. She worked in it this summer. Last year, I don't know of anybody who got any responses to applications for withholding certificates. And under the regulations, the IRS is supposed to answer in 90 days. Right. Quickest I've heard this year, and this is 2021, is four months. Mm -hmm. So if it's this month, we're, we're in September, the end of September, I wouldn't even bother. If, 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 you, if you're a seller, a foreign seller, and somebody's telling you you need to apply for right. this, you know, ask how long it's taking for the IRS to get back to this person, and what's the financial advantage in doing this and paying for that process, and then filing a tax return in February, which is about the earliest you can do it. That's usually when the new returns come out. So late in the year, you're better off in many cases uh, just letting them withhold the money and then filing. Who tax holds return. this money? Well, with Farbar, it could, it, it, the, the 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 buyer has a right just to send it in because mm -hmm. I can just send it in to the IRS mm -hmm. you know, unless right. you agree to fix the 
you know, gas grill right. or whatever we've been arguing about. I mean, yesterday I had people arguing about a coffee maker. So if you're in the middle of arguing about the coffee maker, and then the seller asks you to right. hold his withholding, um, you know, I, I hate to tell you what my answer might be. It wouldn't be, I, I know you're supposed to turn the other cheek, but that's right. tough sometimes. So it's, a, it's, it's something that you have leverage over. It's something you don't have to do. Uh, it, we're supposed to do unto others as we want to do unto us. Well, I know I'm saying the opposite here. Right. But it's, it's survival. If you need them to put the old coffee maker back, which from yesterday it was a $2,000 coffee machine, say, you know, you want me to sign this thing, put back the coffee maker you agreed to sell me. Yeah, well, Don, I think you did a wonderful job explaining this. I hope we've Good. helped our viewers today, and I uh, hope you come back next week or I'll come next back month and you like. uh, have uh, another topic for Is us. Samantha back here, followed it all yeah. pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.